Okay, so welcome again. In the previous videos, we have talked about the image reconstruction methods. We have shown kind of like a historic viewpoint, and also we have gone a bit into the details of every method. How does it work? What are the uh, principles behind it? It was like a, a neural network, a filter, etc. And now uh, we want to kind of uh, discuss them a bit. So. An over, like an overarching discussion about these methods. Which starts with the question. We have seen many methods and the question is what enables image reconstruction? Because we saw at the beginning that direct integration of the events was not good, it was not possible, it was too noisy. Um, and now we have seen many different methods to, to handle event noise and to remove kind of the dependency on the initial condition, that so-called offset. Well, um, it's it's good to make this analysis and try to find what are the common things, the common patterns that uh, uh, enable image reconstruction in the different methods. And, and I think the general idea can be stated as being uh, smoothing or regularization, also known as prior. Right? So you want to come up with a, a solution to your problem and you kind of constrain uh, the set of all possible solutions because you add additional knowledge in the case of um, uh, coming up with a, with an image, then in the case of the manifold regularization, for example, it was explicitly called manifold regularization, but basically it was image denoising using the time map as a, as a guide for denoising. And maybe in the another example is the one from Bardo in 2016, where they were jointly estimating optical flow and uh, image intensity reconstruction and their regularizer were actually explicitly stated as the L1 norm or the L2 norm of uh, quantities. Um, but there were also um, some that were not as uh, evident, right? What is the regularization in, uh, in the time filters? Well, it's it's a different type of regularization, some smoothing, right? It's, it was doing some uh, filtering, some smoothing. Okay, so the general idea is, yes, this some called regularization or prior. And you can do this in a space, which means that neighboring pixels are processed together. And that's the main idea. Or you can also do it in time. So the, the work in 2018 by a group at the Australian National University was processing um, pixels independently, so there were no spatial dependency, only filtering in time, and yet they were showing that image reconstruction is possible uh, in that case, or even without a spatial regularization. So in more general, um, most methods do space-time filtering and space-time regularization. And then the question is, if, uh, if that's the case, then what's the best regularizer, the best smoother, the best prior. Right? And in this, we we found during the, the still short history of image reconstruction that there were some uh, methods that were using handcrafted uh, regularizers in terms of uh, some norm. And more recent ones using deep learning, they were using data and um, natural images for uh, regularizing to, to guide the solution, right? You were not looking for any solution in the space of functions or images, you were looking for uh, ones that had statistics close to those statistics of natural images. And then, of course, uh, this best regularizer prior, it's, it depends, right? It's, there is not only one single criterion, such as accuracy, but typically there are more than one. So how much power or effort you put into the reconstruction, so there is a trade-off. Typically, if you put more effort into reconstructing, you will get uh, better results. But if you want to put this in on a real uh, hardware or platform or a mobile one, you might have limited resources. So you don't want to uh, wait forever to get the best reconstruction. And this is typically something that is not uh, quantified. The trade-off between accuracy and computational effort of the different methods. It would be very nice to have a plot that you could show in both axes for uh, for the different methods and see how how they compare. So, for example, the deep learning ones they may be 
required a lot of computational effort for training and not so much for inference. And they are very accurate, whereas maybe the time filters, they are not as computationally expensive, uh, but also not as accurate. So they are very efficient, let's say that way, that they are very efficient, but not as accurate. Um, okay, and well, these all these methods were developed uh, on prototype cameras, cameras that they are still not as matured as other type of sensors. And we expect as, as event cameras improve over time, then there will be uh, better events. So they will be not as noisy as previous models and they have higher resolution. So you, you will be able to get um, higher spatial details. Okay, <clears throat> well, we have seen a variety of uh, representation and methods, right? Just by looking at the task of image reconstruction without going into studying other tasks, we find a variety of representations. Some methods use event packets, some methods use event by events, such as the time filter. Other methods use event frames, such as Barua from 2016. Uh, other use voxel grids, um, such as uh, Henri in the CBPR paper and the PAMI 2020. Other uses tax of, as, of events, such as uh, the group in South Korea. You see there is um, a variety of event representations and also a variety of processing methods. Uh, some use temporal filters, such as the uh, Cedric and the people at the Australian National University. Other use extended Kalman filters, such as in Imperial College. Variational methods in, in GRADS and in uh, artificial neural networks and GANs, well, now they are more uh, more popular. This is just to show that what we have studied in previous videos, event representations and event processing methods, they have connections and they appear everywhere. And just by looking at one task, image reconstruction, even if we don't look at other tasks such as object recognition or, or SLAM, um, then all the things that we discussed previously or that we studied previously, they are showing up. So I would encourage you to go over the different papers and identify these. So for every paper, what is the event representation and the processing method used and see if they are connected, if they are not connected, if one representation enforces constraints on the processing methods and so on. It's good to get an overview of the, of the, the methods for image reconstruction and all the kind of the whole pipeline of processing events from input to output. So the next question is, what is image reconstruction <clears throat> good for? This could be controversial because I don't think originally events, event cameras were designed for, for image reconstruction, yet it has proven to be quite useful, right? And this, I don't want to go into uh, being a, um, dogmatic about this, right? It's perfectly fine to, to want to do image reconstruction if you want to perset, pursue this, this goal. So for visualization, it's actually very useful, right? To provide visual feedback. Um, if, they, if we have a camera um, such as the DBS that does not output grayscale information, then having some way to get some cheap uh, method or to get some uh, representation such as grayscale images that are more easy to interpret for humans, it's, it's quite good. They are also good for camera calibration if you do not need to, if you do not want to create a new calibration method using events, then you could go from the events to images and then calibrate the images. And because the, the images in principle, they are using the same pixel reference if they are not displaced, then uh, you should be able to then the optical parameters that you estimate or the calibration parameters that you estimate from the images, you would be able to apply them to the events. Um, another is for visualization for um, uh, high dynamic range imaging. So if you want to take kind of photographic mode and we have seen many videos of this and also high speed video generation. So you can combine these two, right? Because the the reconstructions that you you obtain typically they could be high speed and high dynamic range. Okay, another is uh, 
that uh, interesting fact is that these image reconstructions they show the amount of information contained in the event stream. But even if you use a handcrafted method, um, it's difficult to assess how much information is in the events because they are asynchronous and then we think that they are edges and we don't kind of see all the information that is there. But if you can somehow aggregate this information and show um, some familiar way to, to see it, such as grayscale images, well, then actually they show that event camera sends a, a huge amount of information, right? more or less than with respect to standard camera, that's something that we, we would have to go into the details in which range and which conditions. But the fact is that event cameras, they they acquire a huge amount of information. And um, well, it's there for us to, to harness the information in, in those events for our applications. Um, another one is uh, for transferability. So image reconstruction, it's good because then you can use off-the-shelf computer vision algorithms on those images and it typically works well. This is something that uh, the group in Zurich, so Henri and colleagues, they they show, right? You can use the reconstructed images for object classification for visual odometry or also you could, uh, if you have um, correspondence between uh, images and events, um, so what you could do is that use those images, then uh, if these are labeled or you could somehow label these images in a easy or cheap way, then you could uh, transfer the labels um, that you would use for training or supervised learning to the events, reuse them. And some people are actually now researching on, on the topic. And finally, I think the image reconstruction is also good for comparison as a baseline. It means that you are uh, designing a method that will only use the events directly, uh, not going through this intermediate step of reconstructed images. And you would like to measure some accuracy, for example, or some performance. And then you could say, well, how well does my method uh, that uses events uh, directly compare against using uh, and these two steps, first I do image reconstruction and then I apply standard computer vision methods on, on those images. It kind of gives you a, a ballpark of, of how, how well you're doing. But uh, again, when you compare event-based method and frame-based method, there is not only one criterion, right? You could compare inaccuracy and maybe frame-based methods um, show some better performance because it's a mature method, mature technology. Um, but it could be other things such as uh, efficiency and computational performance that they are not as good or as competitive as being event-based. Uh, finally, is uh, image reconstruction needed? This is also kind of a topic that uh, sometimes arises. Uh, well, it depends on the task. For eco-motion estimation, there are works that show that it's not needed. Um, for optical flow estimation, there are also many works showing that it's not it is not needed. But for other things, um, for other things, it's actually essential. For video generation, it's essential. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then we will probably come up with image reconstruction again as we revise some of the other tasks. For references, I encourage you to read section 4.6 of the event-based vision survey. And also in the list of event-based vision resources, this GitHub repo, there is a section on image reconstruction uh, with many, many papers about it and videos. So it's also good to go over them and take a look at them. Yep. Thank you very much.